in the Plashev concentration camp was just like, when I got there, I st when I stepped inside the gate, it was like coming to the end of the world. People were yelling, dogs were barking, barbed wire all around, barracks as far as the eye could see. I looked out there and I thought to myself, from there, I wasn't going to go anywhere. This is going to be my last stop. There was just no way out. In, in this concentration camp, uh, if you saw the movie, you saw Amor Get doing, um, you know, murdering people from the balcony, and uh, this was just an example. Everyone, all these officers who operated the get this camp did exactly the same thing. They all were made of the same stripe. It's just that in the movie, you know, you can't show you atrocity after atrocity after atrocity. You get kind of, your eyes kind of start glazing over after a while. But they were all doing that on a daily basis. There was another time, uh, uh, another one of these officers was walking through the factory where we were working, and I happened to be doing something that I was putting together two pieces of uh, part of a brush and it had to be nailed together with brads, you know, and they're little things, and it's hard to drive through hardwood. Anyway, so I was working on that, and this came over there, and she stood next to me, like, almost pressing against me, and, and she said, if it goes crooked, I'm going to shoot you in the head. You know, at the time, I, I, it didn't register with me. I, I, re I really didn't didn't realize what he had said, and I kept doing it, I kept nailing those things together. He left. And then when I, after the shift was over and I went back to my barracks and thought about what had happened, that's where I got the shakes. It's just, that's kind of life it was. And so, uh, Shindus people who worked in Shindus company had to be escorted from the camp now to his factory. And so he was able to persuade the authorities with a bit, a bit of bribes to uh, let him build a sub-camp next to the factory so his employees could just, instead of being escorted every day back and forth, they could just get out of the barracks, go to work, and go back to the barracks again without guards because it was right adjacent to the factory. And he was able to accomplish that, as you know, and. Uh, my father and my brother went to live there. And then once the camp was built, Schindler was hiring more people. You know, he, now he had a camp, he had more barracks there, and he had a room, and... So he, um, there was a, a list of people made up of about 30, kind of mini Schindler's list of those people who were going to be transferred from a concentration camp, Plashov, to Schindler's company, which was considerably better to, to be in Schindler's company than it was in, in Plashov. And so um, my mother, my, my mother my f and I were on the list. My, my father asked Schindler to add my, my mother and me to the list. And uh, well, I was on the list, and my mother was on the list. We were going to be transferred, and a few days before we were going to be transferred, with my good luck or bad luck, I discovered that my name was crossed off the list and that I was not going to go. And I tried to find out why they did that or who did it or what was the reason for it, but nobody, nobody paid much attention to me. I was a little kid. They just kind of pushed me off and said, never mind, you go back to the brush factory, you know. That's it. And so on the day that they were going to leave, I snuck away from my job in the brush factory and went to see my mother off. I was going to be left alone in this concentration camp. If that had, been, if that had happened, my chances for surviving alone in that camp would have been almost zero. And so I went to see my mother off, and I got closer and closer. And eventually I found myself in front of this 
Nazi officer who was in charge of escorting the group to Schindler's company. Big guy, monstrous looking, scary. I went up to him, told him my name. And I told him my name was on the list and somebody crossed my name off. And then I proceeded to tell him about my family. You know, I'm, I was talking to a guy who doesn't even think I'm human. I was telling him about my mother is on the list and she's in this group. Then I said, my father and my brother are there already. Even then I thought that was a pretty stupid thing to say to a guy like this. But something happened I, I can't explain. He looked at the list, he looked at me, and he just grunted, you know, like that. Pointed to the group. I jumped in, tried to make myself smaller than I really was. <laughs> And it seemed like I was there for a long time waiting for the gate to open, but it wasn't, probably wasn't very long. The group started to move, and I was able to breathe, you know. I ended up working 12-hour shifts in Schindler's company. Night shift, mostly. But I was too short, so, you know, I was little, and, and it was, I was not comfortable with seeing over the machine and reach the controls better. I used to stand on a box about eight inches upside down, you know, and, and I would work there. And Schindler had a habit of, of course, he entertained a lot. He entertained officials all the time in his office, upstairs from the factory. And once the party was over and the guests left, Schindler would come down all by himself, down to factory floor, and walk through slowly, and stop and talk to people. And this is where you could see the difference between a Nazi and a person who did not accept the Nazi ideology. You can imagine he stopped and talked to me and asked me, you know, he'd say, good evening, wait for an answer, Complete, in complete sentences, you know, he asked me how many pieces I've made, which is probably what, something he wasn't in, really interested in knowing, but he just wanted to make a little contact with this kid standing on a box there working this night shift. And, and, um, and sometimes after these visits, when I went to get my ration of food the next day, I would discover that Schindler left word that I should receive two rations. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. You got to you got to remember. You got to think about this a little bit. A man who uh, partied all night and you know had all these guests and came down and you know I guess he didn't have a hangover. He found he found the he found the uh, person who was handing out the rations of food to tell him to give me two rations. That is. You know, it's pretty good. When you have, when you judge Oscar Schindler and his activities during that period, you have to judge him within the context of the times then, not within today's times. If you, if he were doing this uh, within, you know, today, he would be a pretty good manager, a pretty good. CEO, taking care of his employees, you know, and talking to them, making, you know, visiting them, making sure they knew who he was and they, he knew who they were. It was just one of those things that you do if you're a good manager. But in those days, the law of the land was to murder Jews. To treat Jews as human beings was against the law and punishable by concentration camp or worse. And so what he was doing is, was very dangerous to his own well-being. But he did it anyway. And there was no ulterior motive there except that he was, he was a decent human being who was doing the right thing. 